Well, thank you all and the organisers for such a well-organised and uh, friendly and interesting conference. I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we're doing on ash um, at um, Royal Botanic Gardens Q and also within the Centre for Forest Protection. And a lot of this work is now being led by my colleague Laura Kelly, and, and you'll gather that as we uh, move through this presentation. We face a global crisis because human beings are moving pests and pathogens around the world at unprecedented rates. This is just a map of um, annual shipping. Um, and we are moving, um, for example, this list of pests and pathogens around the world, and they are causing great devastation. Arguably, they're affecting ecosystems much more rapidly than climate change is. Um, but it's not a crisis that's talked about very much. But we are in a, a plant health crisis. And we're often moving things which are pretty harmless in their native environment to a place where they are not co-evolved with the local flora and are causing a great deal of damage, some of it which is very hard to predict. Um, so we, we've sort of taken a blender to the globe and we're blending our ecosystems and this is causing a great many problems. Ash trees, of course, are no exception. And the two uh, best known ones that we've moved around are the fungus causing ash dieback, Hymenus gryphus fraxineus, and the emerald ash borer, Agrillus planipennis. So for future ash trees, um, and this is in a UK context, but of course it's more broadly applicable, we need ash trees adapted to a changing climate um, an invasive Asian fungus, uh, potentially an invasive Asian insect, although thankfully the emerald ash borer is not yet with us, and something that supports UK native species as well. And that's quite a tall order. So when ash dieback was first found in the UK in 2012, I applied for funding to sequence the ash genome for the first time, and that ultimately led um, to the 27 publication of that genome. Uh, Eric Keir, who's here, was uh, one of the people who co-authored that with us. It was quite a large consortium. And since then, we've um, updated that reference genome. We've used exactly the same tree. And we've just released on our website a new assembly, which is at a chromosomal level. And it's a much, much better assembly than our previous one. We're now building on that to build a pan-genome of ash. This is a project led by Laura Kelly with postdoc Daniel Wood. And we've heard about pan-genomes, so I won't um, bore you with a new description of what they are. Um, but this should greatly help us in characterising the genetic basis of uh, resistance to pests and pathogens and adaptation to climate. Um, we're sequencing 50 ash trees from across the UK and Europe with Oxford nanopore, and uh, Danny is currently putting all that together into a pan genome. Um, we've been working quite a lot on the genomic basis of ash dieback resistance. Um, this was published um, in 2019, and what we did um, was we took some mass screening trials that were set up by Forest Research soon after ash dieback was found in the UK. Um, there were 14 different sites that were planted, 15 provenances of ash, and a total of 153,000 trees. We took two of the best sites, that's sites where the trees established well but got damaged a lot by ash dieback. Um, here's an example of one of them. And um, some of the trees, a, a tiny minority of trees, you can see them there in the green tips in the bars, remained healthy, and others were unhealthy or dead. This was in 2016. So what we did was we went through the two best sites. We screened 38,000 trees in the two best sites. We took 1,250, half of which were healthy, and each healthy tree was paired with an unhealthy tree from the same provenance. We then pulled the healthy trees from each provenance and the unhealthy trees from each provenance we then did whole genome sequencing on the pools so that we could get allele frequencies in those pools, and then we used that for a GWAS. And this is mapped to our 
old genome, but you can see we found quite a lot of peaks of um, loci putatively associated with um, health under ash dieback. We can call that resistance to ash dieback for short, but you'll appreciate that it is, you know, health symptoms under ash dieback. And some of them seem to have quite nice um, functions that seemed credible. I think you can always say that, but it's always encouraging when that happens. Um, we then did genomic prediction. Um, so we used the several thousand top hits from the GWAS to then do genomic prediction, and we had 150 trees, 75 healthy and 75 unhealthy, that were not in our original pools, and then we sought to predict their genomically estimated breeding values and uh, predict whether or not we thought they should be healthy or unhealthy. Um, here's one of the results using 2,500 SNPs, and you can see that um, we have got slightly higher estimated breeding values for the healthy than for the unhealthy trees. And this level of discrimination, if, if we were crop breeders, we would be reasonably happy that this would be able to help um, in selections for breeding. Now, we've got some new data that suggests that structural variants are also playing a role. Of course, we couldn't look at these previously. Um, we can start to now. This is a very preliminary study that Danny did um, using short read data um, and using methods um, where you don't get proper mapping of the paired reads just to have a preliminary look at what structural variants uh, we might find. And these were mapped to a Polish genome um, that beat us to it to get to a chromosomal level for ASH. Uh, and you can see here the peaks for the, the SNPs. Those are the peaks from the Stocks et al. study that we published in 2019. And then you can see a few peaks that he managed to find for some structural variants. Um, and these seem to be in different places to the SNPs. So we think that there are some SVs involved in resistance to ash dieback that, that are not linked to SNPs that we found. Um, so we're very interested in following that up. We're also looking at natural selection in the wild. And this is a paper that's on BioArchive. Um, it's based in a woodland um, in the UK, uh, managed by the Woodland Trust. It's called Marden Park Wood. Um, it's just outside of London. Um, here's a map of all of the trees um, that we sampled. Um, the size of the circles there roughly corresponds to the, the size of the tree, and the, the black dots are juveniles. So um, we scored the adult trees according to their um, canopy damage, and we scored the younger trees with the pleura method developed in Lithuania, um, looking more closely at damage to wood. It's actually a much more accurate way, but of course we weren't able to do that on the adults. Here's Will Plum and Kerry Metheringham, two PhD students, um, scoring the um, trees um, in the understory, the natural regeneration. Um, we scored them in 2019 and 2021, and as you can see, there's much faster disease progression in the juveniles than in the adults. That corresponds with, with everything else we know um, about ash dieback. We then did whole genome sequencing on 133 of the adult trees and 442 of the juvenile trees, all in that one area. We did them to 10x coverage. And the idea was that the adult trees would, of course, establish before ash dieback came in. So they hadn't really been under ash dieback selective pressure. They were damaged now, but very few adult trees had actually died at this point. They were still holding on. Um, whereas the younger trees, we reasoned, had had opportunity to have been screened by ash dieback. So they may have faced natural selection. They would have faced natural selection, but how strong would that have been? We then looked at the top 10,000 GWAS SNPs from the Stocks et al. paper. And interestingly, within, within this single population, 10% were fixed for the, the good allele, the allele we want that's associated with resistance. 80% were variable, and 10% were fixed for the bad allele. So interestingly, 90% of the alleles that we want to be there for natural selection to select for resistance are there in the population. So that was quite encouraging. I, I thought that the number might be lower. We then um, worked out genomically estimated breeding values for all of those individuals based on the SNPs using the model we trained in the Stocks et al. paper. 
But as you can see, we didn't find a good correlation between the health scores that we had taken and um, our GEBVs. Now, that wasn't unexpected because here in a, in a natural population, there's huge environmental variability. Trees are different ages in slightly different environments. They're competing with different species. You know, this, this is not a field trial condition where everything's evenly spaced and evenly aged. And also we have to bear in mind that with the juveniles, the most susceptible individuals had probably already disappeared. And indeed, I'll show you evidence that that was indeed the case. So what, the, what we then did was just compared the mean GEBVs for the adults and the juveniles. And the juveniles had slightly higher GEBVs, about 7% higher, suggesting that they are more resistant to ash dieback. But this was not statistically significant because we were just comparing means of, of these not particularly large samples. Then what we did was um, we compared the GBVs of the juveniles against another GBV that we had calculated for them based on their relatedness to the parents in the population and the GBVs of the parents. So we, we predicted the GBVs of the juveniles as if they were just a random set of offspring from those parents. And when we, when we compared those two GBVs that we'd calculated for the juveniles, we found a shift, a shift of 5.8%. And we had much more statistical power now because it was effectively a pairwise comparison, and that was highly statistically significant. So we're finding a shift um, towards greater resistance to ash dieback. And um, we don't quite know what heritability is in the wild for ash dieback resistance. Um, if it's 0.4, then we're seeing elimination by selection in the juveniles of 13%. But if heritability is as low as 0.1, then the, um, the number of individuals that would have had to have been eliminated to have given us this shift would be 60%. Now, because of the way we did this, comparing those two calculations of GBV for the juveniles, this shift doesn't include the effect of greater seed or pollen production by healthy parent trees versus ones that are more um, susceptible to ash dieback. We then looked to see um, what was better at predicting the scores of um, the juvenile trees for those where we actually knew what, who, who their parents were in a paternity and maternity analysis. And we found that the GBV of the parent tree was a much better predictor than the actual canopy cover of the parent tree, the, the phenotype we saw in the field. So it suggests that GBVs could be a better way of selecting trees for breeding programs than canopy cover estimates. Um, Laura Kelly has just won a new NERC grant um, that will follow up this work in natural populations, looking at structural variants as well as SNPs, and she'll be looking at three different populations. And the fieldwork for that is ongoing um, right now, um, sampling um, adults and juveniles and scoring them. Here's some of the natural regeneration that we're seeing in woodlands in the UK. It's quite encouraging. I've got one minute left, so I'm going to be very rapid about rapid cycle breeding. Um, so one thing that we're thinking about is, well, what could a breeding program do for trees? Niels uh, Muller alluded to this. You know, with something like wheat, we've been able to massively increase yields. We haven't even tried doing that with forest trees. What would happen if we did? Um, but of course, we have a problem in that generation times are so long that no one can even try because they'll be dead by the time they get to the second or third generation. But one approach would be to find loci that can predict the trait we're interested in, which in this case is resistance, and we've done that. And then engineer early flowering in a line of our species of interest. And we have um, collaborators at Rothamsted Research in the UK who have developed protocols for transforming ash and are now beginning to experiment with um, inserting constructs to try to induce early flowering. If we can do that, we can then bring those two things together and have rapid cycle breeding using genomic selection on the juveniles. And then we can go through several generations where we're selecting for the SNPs that we believe are associated with resistance to ash dieback, and indeed we could try and throw in SNPs that we think are associated with resistance to EAB. I haven't been able to um, cover that today. Um, and then in the final generation, 
segregate out the transgenes that give the early flowering, and we end up with a tree that doesn't have any transgenes in it, but has been through several generations of conventional breeding. And I'm hoping that that would not be counted as a genetically modified or gene edited tree. Um, so here's another sketch of, of how that would work. Um, I just want to highlight our online resources. Um, we have a website, Ash Tree Genomes. This was recently revamped. You can get a good overview of what we've been doing at that website. And we've got a Zenodo community where we're uploading lots of our stuff. And anyone is very welcome who's working on Ash to, to upload things to this. We don't want it to be just for us. Um, and in conclusion, uh, we've got a good reference genome now for Ash. We're working on a pan genome. We've uncovered at least some of the genetic basis for resistance to ash dieback within UK ash, and now we're working on structural variants. Natural selection is increasing the resistance of ash populations, we believe, and we're now looking at how structural variants are also involved in that. And a rapid cycle breeding program is now possible, and we're seeking funding for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Do we have some questions for Richard? Harry seems to have the hands. Very nice talk, very good work. So uh, my question is, uh, compared to the phenotypic selections, how accurate the genomic selections? Um, well, we think it's a lot more accurate. Um, particularly in, in a natural woodland setting where heritability is, is probably very low. That's great, yeah. Another thing is so flowering. So you uh, introduce some like uh, alleles where early flowering. For, you want early flowering. How can you do that? You, have, you find some alleles can generate early flowers in ash. Well, no, we haven't, but what, what other people have done to, to induce early flowering is, is introduced flowering loci either from the same species, sort of duplicating the flowering loci, or from Arabidopsis. Um, so this has been done in, in Apple um, several years ago, and uh, Niels actually told me it's been done for, for Poplar as well, which I hadn't realised, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a really, really clear, really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering with the uh, rapid cycle breeding, how do you account for local adaptation in those trees? Is it going to be the case that they're really resistant, but actually not at all suited to the environment that they're going to be planted in? Yeah, that's, that's sort of what we would have to find out. It would be very hard unless, unless we were able to genomically predict local adaptation for lots of different local populations. I think we would have to sort of take the risk on that one, just focus on um, resistance breeding. And then I don't think it would be tragic if they weren't particularly well local adapted because we could use them in enrichment plantings. So we could plant out this tree that's sort of got a collection of all the alleles you want for resistance. And if that was planted in a natural population, it could then enhance the gene pool of that population um, in a context where natural selection would retain the, the, the local adaptation. Any other questions? Christian seems to have one. Yeah, very simple question. You show that at low heritabilities, you need quite high selection pressure, so high sele removal by selection. But I thought 60% or even higher is actually quite common in ash dieback. Yeah, I, I could quite believe that 60% are, are being selected. Yeah. I mean, we, we know that younger trees are more rapidly... Um, killed. They're also much closer to the sporulation because, of course, the fungus is sporulating on dead leaves on the forest floor. So you could imagine that it would, it, 
it would be very intense selective mm. pressure. Yeah. Any more? I was thinking, um, as a breeder, is there any G by E in this resistance? Do you have any? Uh, can you breed the same material for all Europe, where the disease has been, or does every region has to do this? That's a good question. Um, I remember Eric talking about G by E years ago, looking at different environments and the levels of, of resistance to ash dieback. Um, obviously, our studies so far are based entirely on UK materials. Um, I think there might have been one French provenance um, in, in the mass screening trials. So we can't say a lot about um, elsewhere, I'm afraid. 